Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on cable television. We are glad you are with us today for our program this Friday the 31st of October 2008. Happy Halloween, everyone. In case you're wondering, I'm dressed as a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> for the fellow Stowe Reeves lawyers that are here, they're gonna know that I masquerade as a lawyer every day, so glad you're here. Our program today, four days before Tuesday's historic election, features a presentation by a nationally known analyst and prolific author on the subject of the future of, American, of America's politics and economy and the impact on the middle class. Very timely topic. Before we begin our program, however, I have a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting around you and our radio and television audiences, for those of you in the room who have not already done so, please turn off your cell phones and any other device that would make noise. We are pleased to have four Friday Forum corporate sponsors again this quarter without whose financial support these time-honored Friday Forum uh, luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are AARP Oregon, Comcast, Three Mile Canyon Farms, and the law firm of Baron Liebman LLP. We also are, hang on a second, we also are grateful to Reed College, whose support was invaluable in bringing today's speaker both to Portland and to City Club. So we thank our corporate sponsors and Reed College for their generous support. Thank you. <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm pleased that we have one self-identified new member with us today, and I would like her to stand and be recognized, Laura Hine from Stoll Reeves. Laura, you can give me a Rose Festival wave. Thank you. <laughs> Next week's Friday Forum program will feature the last of City Club's Making Sense of the Election programs that have been held during these last several months. So next week on November 7th, a panel of Oregon political experts and analysts, Tim Hibbets, Liz Kaufman, and Dan Levy will do a post-election review right here to tell us what they expect from our new president, our new Congress, and our new state legislature, and what the overall fallout of Tuesday's vote likely will be as best they can tell us. <clears throat> so it should be very interesting, very uh, uh, enlightening. Please join us. And in that the election is still uh, before us, many of us have not voted yet, remember that City Club has taken positions on six state ballot measures. The positions of the club are printed in the last bulletin or you can go online and give you the City Club's position on how we recommend that people vote on those six ballot measures. So now to our program. Long before the United States and the world began to experience the current financial upheaval, the greatest since the Great Depression in the 1930s, it was the belief of many observers that this country was headed into a new political and social era. Indeed, the selection of John McCain and Barack Obama as their respective parties' nominees for president, candidates who were not, after all, from the mainstream establishments of their parties and were not, at the beginning, expected to prevail, furthered the notion that a societal shift of historic proportions perhaps was in the air. From this view, what happens next Tuesday and the aftermath of that election could be a true watershed in our national story. Yet this kind of major change can be very unsettling and leave many of us wondering where it will really take us as a society and what the implications actually will be for us as individuals and families and companies and businesses. While City Club is exceedingly fortunate to have as our speaker today someone of a true national stature who is highly qualified to delve into these very issues. An Oregon native, our speaker is a professor of political science at the University of California at Berkeley, the co-director of Berkeley's Center for Health, Economic, and Family Security, and a fellow at the New American Foundation. In 2007, he received a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to develop a survey that would measure perceptions of economic insecurity. He also is overseeing a social science research council project on the privatization of economic risk. You just think about that, that's something we've been hearing an awful lot about, the privatization or the uh, nationalization of economic risk. 
A prolific author, as I mentioned, our speaker is well known for his writing on social policy and health care reform. His book, Off Center, analyzed the roots and results of governmental extremism. In his most recent book, The Great Risk Shift, The New Economic Insecurity and the Decline of the American Dream, explores the rising anxiety of America's middle class. Now, he grew up in Eugene until moving to Portland in the eighth grade. And indeed, his father is noted architect Thomas Hacker of the firm uh, Thomas Hacker and Associates in Portland, who's here, welcome. Uh, our speaker is a graduate of Lincoln High School, where he also met his wife, Ona Hathaway, who is now a law professor at Berkeley. So we got a professor of political science and a law professor, both at Berkeley, quite the family. I'd hate to be those kids. Um, in, in true Oregon and Portland style, he was the state UCSF cycling champion. For those of you who are cyclists, I'm sure you know what that means. He thinks 11 times when he was in high school. And he tells me that one of his real claims to fame is having been listed in a local magazine article about Portlanders who have made it big. And he was one of two from Lincoln High School, himself and Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. And as he puts it, how many academics have the stature of Bart Simpson? So please welcome back to Portland, one of our own, Dr. Jacob Hacker. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm privileged to speak to those of you in the audience, to those of you who will be listening to me this evening on public radio. Uh, I was told that I wasn't able to use my PowerPoint slides because you wouldn't be able to see them if you were listening. Um, so I'll try to keep the, uh, the visuals to a minimum. I usually like to sort of dance around and, uh, and move away from the podium, but today I'm going to stay rooted. It's, it's a real privilege to speak with you, and I'm going to, if you forgive me, I'm going to use one visual. Uh, because it's pretty topical. It came from today's Oregonian. It just arrived in front of my hotel room. On the first page, uh, above the fold, foreclosed. And on the second page, economy stays its course, down. Um, and I don't think there could be a more timely reminder of what's at stake in this election. This is by far the most important election of, of my lifetime. And I thought that before the headlines were blaring about foreclosures uh, and falling uh, falling economic output. Um, and I think the reason that my concern was so great is also the reason why so many people are looking forward to Tuesday with a mix of anticipation and excitement and concern. And that is because it seems as if over the last few months something that was beneath the radar screen but nonetheless in all of our minds has burst to the surface. And that is that the American middle class, the American dream, is at risk. In a way, this word foreclosure captures more than just what's happened to our housing market. We feel a foreclosure in our politics and in our lives, and we're hoping for an opening. And that's why this election looms so large in most of our minds. A few years ago, when I was out talking about this book, I was trying to convince people that economic risk was something they should care about. Uh, now I find myself trying to convince them from, to crawl down from window ledges. Um, and I want to say right off the bat that although I believe these problems we face are serious, that my fundamental view on them has not changed. The challenges are great, but they are challenges that we as a society can meet. Our workers are productive, our employers are innovative, our nation at its best is a beacon to the world. There is nothing wrong, as Bill Clinton put it, with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. But we need to start fixing what's wrong today. So when I was on this book tour a couple years ago, talking about the book, I came here to Portland uh, and did an event at Powell's bookstore that my parents came to. I asked them to bring a couple softball questions to throw at me in case the uh, conversation flagged. And that was a great experience. Then I headed up north and, and was planning to do a talk in Seattle at the town hall forum. And when I got there, there was a large crowd assembled outside, hundreds of people. Uh, and there was this low hum from within the auditorium. And I started to get nervous and excited and, uh, well, frankly, a little scared. Um, but I was really gratified and flattered that so many people would come to see me. That is until I saw a sign next to the door that said, if you're here to see Professor Hacker speak, he'll be in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so the person who was speaking today was, a, was another hometown boy a Northwest boy, and that was Ed Viesters. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ed Vistras has climbed all the major peaks in the world without supplemental oxygen. Um, now, that's pretty impressive. I told all the people in the audience, all 12 of them, that I had, that I had written all my books without supplemental oxygen, uh, but, but somehow that just didn't, didn't impress them. I know us, we academics are not the most exciting lot. I'm reminded of one of the first evaluations I received when I was a new assistant professor. It said, Professor Hacker, if I had just 15 minutes to live, I'd want to spend it in your class. Because that way it would seem like an hour. <laughs> so I want to speak for a little more than 15 minutes, and I hope that it seems about as long as it takes. I like talking about Ed Vesters, not just because what he's done is amazing, but because Ed Vesters personifies risk taking. There he is climbing these peaks out over ice crevasses. And Ed Vesters is prepared for these risks. Indeed, he's taken them on willingly. Well, the risks I want to talk about today are very different. They're the economic risks that American families, and particularly middle class families, are facing. And they're not, for the most part, risks that they've taken on willingly. We've heard much about risk in the current financial crisis. I think it's the word, in a way, that unites the stories of what's happening around kitchen tables and the stories of what's happening around boardroom conference tables. But I feel like we've heard far too much about the risks that are facing those at the top and not enough about the risks that are facing the rest of us. We focus on the big boys who are too big to fail, as we're told. And I guess American families are just too small to save in this current crisis. We talk about bailouts on the one hand and bankruptcy reform that makes it harder to file for bankruptcy on the other. So what I want to talk about is the other side of the financial crisis, the side of the financial crisis that was going on well before the crisis that has roiled our stock markets and our financial markets. And I want to start by talking about a person. He's not Joe the plumber. <laughs> You're welcome. He's Arnold the air conditioner repairman. <laughs> So I write about Arnold Dorsett in the book. He is an air conditioner repairman. He makes a very good living, much better than his father ever did, about $70,000 a year. He has a suburban home. He's married. He has three children. But it turns out that Arnold Dorsett's American dream is really a nightmare because he's working those 90-hour weeks, and his wife, Sharon, is staying at home to care for the kids rather than going to finish her nursing degree because he's trying to pay medical bills that are crushing the family's finances. You see, the family has a young boy, Zachary, one of their three kids, who has a rare immune system disorder. By the time the disorder is diagnosed at age eight, the family's already run up $30,000 in credit card bills to pay for his care, even though they have private health insurance. They couldn't make their car payments, they couldn't make their mortgage payments, and eventually, in 2005, they succumbed to the inevitable and filed for bankruptcy, becoming one of roughly two million households that filed for bankruptcy in that year. And this is what Arnold Dorsett said about his situation. He said, I make good money and I work hard for it. When I filed for bankruptcy, I felt that I had failed. Arnold Dorsett felt that he had failed, that somehow he was responsible for the plight that had befallen his family. And yet Arnold Dorsett is hardly alone. I mentioned that two million American households filed for bankruptcy in 2005. Well, the research suggests that something like half of those bankruptcies are due in part to medical costs and crises. That means that every 30 seconds in the United States, someone files for bankruptcy because they can't afford medical care or they can't work because they're sick. Some of you may have seen a recent study that just came out about the foreclosure crisis. It was striking. Almost half of foreclosures, according to the study, have a medical care component. That is, the people who couldn't make their mortgage payments were partially unable to because of the cost of medical care or because they, they couldn't work because they were sick. And this is really the dirty little secret of our system. Most of these people had health insurance. It just wasn't there for them when they got sick. So maybe we should consider those people the lucky ones, because we know 
that about 50 million Americans don't have health insurance at all. You've heard that number enough times to have it kind of ingrained in your memory. But I think there's a number that actually more accurately captures what's happening and why it's so serious. One out of three. One out of three non-elderly Americans go without health insurance every two years. These could be people just like you. Indeed, that's what the research suggests. And the majority of those who go without health insurance go without health insurance for more than nine months. Now I have to warn you because, you've, as you've already realized, I have a fondness for statistics. It may be my academic pointy-headed uh, predilection, but I invoke as a defense none other than Bill Moyers, who once said, the mark of an educated man is to be deeply moved by statistics. <laughs> so I hope, I hope you'll forgive me. And one statistic I just want to share with you is about why this is more than just a dollar and cents issue. Why it's really a life and death issue. Just last year, the Urban Institute did a study and they estimated that more people in the United States die each year because of lack of universal health insurance. More working age people die each year because of lack of universal health insurance than die because of homicides in the United States. Mark Carrera, whom I write about in the book, was almost one of these. He left a union job to become an independent contractor, and when he was starting out his new business, he simply couldn't afford health insurance. Then one day he woke up with a headache. Like most people without health insurance, he tried to pretend it wasn't there. He popped aspirin, and finally he, he went to the hospital. Well, it turned out that he'd had two strokes, he was bleeding on the brain, and because he was ineligible for Medicaid, he now has $225,000 in medical debt. Here's what Mark Carrera said. If I ever come into any money, the first people I've got to pay back is for this medical coverage. So I've said something about health care, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that health care is the only place where this shift of risk has occurred. It really is just the tip of a larger iceberg. In almost every facet of middle class economic lives, from health care to pension plans to job security and family finances, we've seen risk and responsibility shift from the broad shoulders of government and corporations onto the fragile backs of workers and their families. And the big reason for this, as you know, is that the United States is uniquely reliant on employers and employment-based benefits to provide people with protection against what FDR once called the hazards and vicissitudes of modern economic life. In the U.S., uniquely, American employers serve as many welfare states, the first line of defense for millions of workers buffeted by the winds of economic change. And employers carry out these duties not out of the goodness of their heart, but in large part because of the encouragement of the federal government, which devotes literally hundreds of billion dollars a year to subsidizing private workplace benefits through the tax code. When you take these private benefits and our tax policies into account, we actually spend more than Denmark on social benefits in the United States. But today, those benefits are coming undone, and risk is shifting back onto workers and their families. Employers, quite understandably, want out of the old social contract negotiated after World War II with unions. And because there aren't many unions around to stop them today, they're largely getting what they want. Meanwhile, government hasn't stepped in to fill the growing gaps in our workplace-based system of economic security. I mentioned health insurance. It's just worth noting that at its peak in the late 1970s, private health insurance from employers covered about 70% of workers. 70% of workers got health insurance from their own employer. More recently, the number has fallen to around 55%. And you might think this is just because less educated workers aren't getting coverage, but that's not true. One out of three, actually a bit more than one out of three recent college graduates start their first job without health insurance. We've seen it also in pensions. In 1980, more than 80% of medium and large firms offered a so-called defined benefit pension plan, a guaranteed pension that gave you a fixed benefit for the remainder of your life. In the, in the most recent years, the number's been down around a third, and it continues to fall. 
Now, defined contribution pension plans like 401ks have largely filled the gap. There's been a decline in pension coverage, and that's notable. It is the case that after 25 years of a growing economy and growing stock market, less than half of workers have a pension plan at their place of work still today. It's nonetheless the case that defined contribution 401k plans have filled the gap, but they have not filled that gap with the same kind of protections. A defined contribution plan is a voluntary investment account that's sponsored by your employer and heavily subsidized by the government to encourage high income people to save. About 70% of the tax breaks for defined contribution pension plans go to the richest 20% of Americans. So these are very skewed, but even more important, defined contribution plans place all the risk onto workers. You have to contribute. You have to invest. You have to bear the risk, including the risk of outliving your assets and retirements. Last week I testified before a congressional field hearing and I said that we've moved from the traditional three-legged stool of Social Security, guaranteed private pensions, and private savings to a two-legged stool, Social Security and private savings both inside and outside 401ks. We all know how wobbly a two-legged stool can be. Now, we've heard about what's happened to people's 401ks with the stock market crash. But I want to give you a more systematic picture very briefly. The Center for Retirement Research at Boston College has looked at the proportion of people who are working, of working age, who will have adequate income in retirement when they reach 65. In 1983, that number was 43 percent. Sorry, that number was seven, uh, 69 percent. So 31 percent of people didn't have adequate retirement savings. In 2004, the proportion who didn't have adequate savings was 43 percent. Again, after a decade in which the stock market exploded in value. That's not really, to me, the most worrisome side of the picture. If you look at people in my age group, those born between 1965 and 1972, roughly half are on track to retire without adequate income. And all of the decline, according to the research, is due to the weaker assurances that are provided by defined contribution 401k style pension plans. These numbers I've given you are from what's called the Retirement Risk Index. And I think it's a good name because retirement as we know it and as we once knew it is at risk. So that word risk, that's what I want you to think about today. Risk is the lens that allows us to see through the current news and understand what's happening to middle class finances. I mentioned that in 2005, two million households filed for bankruptcy. The number in 1980 was 290,000. We've talked about home mortgage foreclosures. Well, if you go back just a few years to the early 2000s, home mortgage foreclosures were already five times more likely than they had been in the 1970s. Now they're 10 times, 15 times more likely, depending on whether you're looking at this week's data or next week's, because things are so bad. I mentioned in my book that one in 60 mortgage-owning households every year enter the foreclosure process. Now we're talking about perhaps one in 25. I write about one such family, David Lamberger and his family, in the book. He bought a modest home in the metro Detroit area as an investment for himself and his wife and for their four children. But like many people in the Detroit area, he lost his job and he had to declare bankruptcy to keep his home. But even after declaring bankruptcy, he hasn't been making enough working at a used car lot to pay the minimum payments. And so now his home is about to enter the foreclosure process and may be auctioned off to the highest bidder in the local courthouse. Foreclosure and bankruptcy are, are sort of the dramatic ruptures in the fabric of family finances. But I think a more telling indicator of what's going on can be seen in the instability of family incomes, an area where I've done a good deal of research. We've heard a lot about the gap between Bill Gates and Joe Citizen, which has grown dramatically. But we hear much less about the gap between Joe Citizen in a good year and Joe Citizen in a bad year. The one thing I looked at was 
what's the proportion of people who experience a 50% or greater drop in their family's income? That's a huge, dramatic decline. Well, in the early 1970s, about one in 30 individuals experienced a drop of that size. And I'm looking here only at people who are working, working age individuals. Today, in recent years, the number has been about one in 10, experiencing a drop of 50% or greater. And about half of the people who experience these drops fall into poverty as a result. David Lamberger sums it up pretty well. He says, there have been years I made $80,000 and years I made $28,000. Sometimes we're able to pay the bills and get by, but then the stuff from the slow times never goes away. You can't come back, you can't catch up, and it comes back to haunt you. And David Lamberger, obviously, is a blue collar worker. But it's worth noting that even people who've gone to college are experiencing much higher rates of income instability. In fact, the income instability of college graduates today is higher than the income instability of high school dropouts in the 1970s. You can't catch up. That's what David Lamberger said. And that's how too many middle class Americans feel. Our savings rate has plummeted from about 9% in the 1980s to 1.7% on average so far this decade. Several years, we got down below 0%, which has not happened since the Great Depression. Household debt has exploded. If you look at the typical married couple with kids, in 2004, their debt was about 125% of income on average. The other thing to say is that most Americans don't have a personal safety net outside their home, and that's a pretty weak net right now, to deal with these income fluctuations. A recent study found that if you look at families with incomes between two and, f and four times, sorry, two and six times the federal poverty level, which is about forty to $120,000 for a family of four, more than half had absolutely no financial assets outside their home, none whatsoever. And this, I think, helps us understand why there has been so high levels of concern about the economy even before these recent market reversals. For one thing, we have to understand that people value greatly economic security. It's deeply ingrained in the human psyche. In fact, behavioral economists have a name for this. It's called loss aversion. And you can test it on your kids, uh, if you wish. Um, give, give them a toy and see how happy they are. Then try to take it away and see how much of a fight they put up. Loss aversion is the idea that people deeply fear losing what they have. And even opportunity-loving Americans are affected by this deep psychological trait. For example, a survey in 2005 asked people whether they were more concerned about the opportunity to make money in the future or the stability of knowing that their present sources of income are protected. Now, I don't know about you, but before I saw the results of the survey, I kind of assumed that Americans would say, more money. But in fact, 62% favored stability and just 29% favored opportunity. We've been hearing a lot about how there's somehow this disconnect between what the polls show people think about the economy and what the fundamentals show. We've been hearing a lot about how this somehow reflects a, a mental recession, as Phil Graham put it, uh, that the US is a nation of whiners. But I think the truth is that people know something that the pollsters don't. For example, a poll asked people, are you worried about losing your job? Are you frequently worried about losing your job? In the early 1980s, we had a 10% unemployment rate. It was the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. And a healthy 12% of Americans said they were worried about losing, frequently worried about losing their job. In the early 2000s, which was a shallow recession by historical standards, 36% of Americans said they were frequently worried about losing their job. And they know something. Because if you look at the statistics on job loss, the early 2000 recession was actually as bad as the early 1980s recession in terms of the proportion of people who involuntarily lost their jobs. And the cost of losing jobs has been going up. Part of this is long-term unemployment, which we don't hear much about. But let me give you one statistic on it. In 2001, the average worker was unemployed for about 13 weeks. In the most recent downturn, it was, it's been 17.5 weeks. In every recession, the problem of long-term unemployment has gone up. In 2001, 700,000 people exhausted their unemployment benefits after six months. In 2008, 1.4 million 
people did. And we might think that this growing problem is just affecting those workers on the periphery of the labor market, the young, the unskilled, but that's not true. It's exactly the opposite. It's older workers, it's skilled workers who are having the hardest time getting back into the market given the knowledge and skills that are required in our rapidly moving economy. These are men like Craig Hayer, whom I write about in the book. He was a 43-year-old engineer, like many engineers in the Northwest. He was working in the tech sector. He was married with three kids. And in 2001, after the events of 9-11, he was laid off from an e-commerce startup. He found a new job, but he had to take a 40% cut in pay. And a few weeks later, he lost that job. He said that his dream used to be to get a great job. And now he says, my only dream is to get a job. But he's not dreaming too much because he has a problem that's called night terrors. He wakes up in the middle of the night, bathed in sweat, screaming at the top of his lungs. It used to happen every now and then. Now it's happening almost every night. Survey after survey shows that what Craig is experiencing is just a dramatic example of the baseline anxieties that Americans are feeling. I won't go through all the evidence, but I worked with the Rockefeller Foundation and with other organizations to put in the field a number of surveys over the last few years that have shown again and again that Americans feel that the American dream is slipping away, that they are facing more risk for less reward, that they are less secure and that their children will be less secure than they were. And that was the essence of the American dream, the idea of security and opportunity and greater opportunity and security for the next generation. I don't want to go past what I think is the most fundamental issue in many ways, the risk-reward trade-off. You've heard about this. You go into the stock market, you face more risk because the rewards are greater. So are Americans reaping great rewards for the greater risks that they've been taking on? Unfortunately, for the middle class, the answer is no. We have very, very good evidence on this from a very reputable source, the Congressional Budget Office. What it has done is collected information about the total income of American households. That's their income from their paycheck, from their assets, from government benefits, as well as what they pay in taxes. It's a comprehensive measure of income. And what they found is that the middle fifth of households, for the moment we'll just say that's the middle class, has seen only about a 21% increase in income after adjusting for inflation from 1979 to 2005. I'll repeat that just because it's kind of hard to believe. A 21% increase in income over 26 years in real dollars. Well then, it must have just been a really terrible economic time. No one's done very well, I guess. No. What about the top 1%, the richest 1% of Americans? Over that same period, their average incomes increased from $326,000 to over $1.2 million on average. That's a 230% increase. That's a more than tripling of the income of the top 1%. So the middle class has been falling behind in part because more and more of the gains of economic growth have been going elsewhere. You may have heard this joke, the economy's so good, I have two jobs. Well. It's a joke that American middle class is living because unlike the middle class family of the leave it to beaver era, now middle class families have two jobs. They have two parents in the workforce. Well, it turns out that that second earner, having a woman in the workforce, which wasn't true on average a generation ago, accounts for about two thirds of that 21% gain I just mentioned. That means that the main reason the middle class is getting ahead at all is that they're working more and more hours. This helps explain the strain and it helps explain letters like the one that was sent to me by Andrea Case, a middle class woman living in New Jersey. Who is the candidate for people like me, she wrote. Where is the AARP for families? I feel like we need the equivalent of the Million Mom March to let candidates know that parents with young children are hurting. How can busy, overwhelmed parents be educated and motivated? How can we have our voice heard above those of huge PACs and corporations? I know this is nearly a rant, but I'm angry and frustrated and don't know where to turn to be effective in getting the leadership this country needs. It's a good question. Where have our leaders been? Until recently, I'm afraid, 
As Americans take on more risk, they've been telling them, take on more. We've been told that we should shift out of Social Security into individual private retirement accounts. We've been told that we should get tax breaks to get individual coverage in the individual market rather than from our employer. We've been told we need health savings accounts so we can put more skin, more skin in the game. The ownership society, remember that phrase? It was all about how if Americans had more control over their economic destiny, if they took on more risk, they would be free to choose. Well, the truth is, as we're seeing today, is that also means that far too many Americans are free to lose. I like to think of the ownership society as a bit like giving a lead weight to a drowning man on the assumption that now he will really have an incentive to learn how to swim. So one side wants to shift risk, but what about the other? I'm afraid there too we have not had much response. Sure, there are strong defenses of existing programs, and yet where is the vision that we need in this new economy? for the 21st century. Too often, defenders of existing programs are seen as standing up for those who've fallen on hard times, rather than helping those who want to pull themselves up by providing a basic foundation of security. Lately, there's been a lot of hand-wringing in democratic circles about why working-class white voters just won't vote for Democrats. Tom Frank made lots of headlines in the bestseller list by asking, what's the matter with Kansas? And his answer was, Kansas is in the thrall of a great cultural freakout. Distracted by their economic needs and priorities, working class Americans are rushing to Republicans to beat back pro-abortion forces and to say no to gay marriage. Well, as a political scientist, I have to say the answer that Tom Frank gave is wrong. The research is clear on this. People have been siding with the Republican Party who are facing hard economic times because they like the Republican economic prescription, or at least don't think there's something on the other side. Uh, except in 1992 and 2004, in every election since 1976, Republicans have had an edge on the economy. People who say the economy is more important to their vote are more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. The story here is not just a story of bad democratic strategies. It's a story of a fundamental change in the organization of our politics. A decline in the organizations like voluntary cross-class associations and unions that once brought middle-class Americans into politics and helped inform them of their interests when people ask what's the matter with Kansas, I want to say, what's the matter with middle class organization and how can we fix it? To be sure, in the vacuum that's resulted, the Democrats have not shown their finest, uh, finest strengths. The golden rule of politics has too often prevailed. He who has the gold rules. And Democrats have felt cross pressured by those with the gold. Perhaps the best example of this is Chuck Schumer who, after writing a book about the importance of defending middle class interest, sided with hedge funds in saying that they should have special tax treatment of their outsized earnings. So we need to have a broader debate. And we need to get beyond the binary politics that has dominated our nation for too long. Democrats are stuck in neutral, and Republicans have been racing to the right. I've done research on this, and this is not a statement of ideological commitment. It is what the research shows. The typical Senate Republican is about twice as conservative, according to his or her voting record, than was a senator from the party a generation ago. Democrats have gotten moderately more liberal, but the big story is to shift the Republicans to the right. But it doesn't matter who's moving where. The result is that polarization has come to define and describe our political climate in a way that has made it more and more difficult to address the festering problems in our society. Our framework of social protection is focused on the aged overwhelmingly, 
even when younger Americans are facing new strains. It is focused on short-term exits from the workforce, even when the obsolescence of skills has become a more severe problem. It is focused at times on the antiquated notion that family strains can be dealt with by a second earner, a woman who can leave the workforce when there is a need for a parent at home. And that can no longer be assumed. And it's based on the idea, above all, that job-based private insurance can easily fill the gaps left by public programs when it's ever more clear that it cannot. In all these areas, the failure of our politics is the failure to address the real concerns of the middle class. There is a powder keg of discontent out there, and it is going to turn American politics upside down unless it is addressed. And yes, it may favor Democrats now. I have a colleague who's writing a paper entitled Crushed by the Crash about uh, the Republican Party. Um, but over the long term, I'm not so sure that's the case. There are thoughtful thinkers on the Republican side who are trying to think about how best to address workers' anxieties. They speak, for example, of Sam's Club Republicans, uh, conservative uh, working class uh, voters who want a, a, Repub a Republican Party that appeals to their economic interests. So while the era after the era of big government is now over, we don't know what will take its place. My own view, and that's where I want to end, is that we need to get beyond the short-term focus of this current crisis and think seriously about how we construct an economic security and opportunity agenda for a new century. We need nothing less than a new New Deal. And by that I don't mean the same kinds of ideas and programs that we saw during the 1930s, though they'd be a vast improvement over some of the response we've seen thus far. What I mean is a true rethinking of the respective roles of government, employers, families, and citizens, a public-private partnership, if you will, that creates a basic foundation of financial democracy in the United States. This happened during the New Deal. It happened after World War II with the GI Bill. It must happen again. We need to get back to the basics, if you will. We need to make sure that our financial markets are focused on the needs of Main Street and not Wall Street. To make sure that people can buy a home, go to college, invest in their future with confidence rather than fear. One thing is clear, and I have lots of ideas in the book for how to do this. We need to come up with ideas for portable protections that move with people from job to job. Universal 401ks, job-based benefits that uh, are no longer closely tied to exactly where one works. Help for parents who are struggling to balance work and family. And above all, universal health care. And so I want to end with a few words about that goal. And I should say, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that I work closely with both the Clinton and Obama campaign on the health care issue. Uh, and the proposal I'm going to talk about informed theirs. But it's also different, as you'll see, in some important respects. And more important, it's just a blueprint. What I really think is crucial is that we start to have a conversation about how we move beyond the failing system that we have today. So my proposal has three central elements. Shared risk, shared responsibility, and individual responsibility. The shared risk is that I would create a new national insurance pool through which people who didn't have coverage from their employers could buy either public insurance or private plans. Shared responsibility is that I would tell employers that either they provide good coverage to their workers or help pay for coverage through this new national pool. An individual responsibility would be a requirement that all Americans have health insurance, but that requirement would, would mean that the government was obligated to provide effective support to make sure that that coverage was affordable. I've developed this plan in some detail. If you're interested in it, you can go to the website of the Economic Policy Institute's Shared Prosperity Agenda. It's sharedprosperity, one word, dot org. And there you can find estimates of the cost and coverage effects of this proposal. To just give you the bottom line, the, cover, the program would cover all Americans, half through this new national pool, and half through employment-based health insurance. And it would cost our nation no more than we're spending now 
for health care. So it sounds like a pretty good deal. Not only that, over the next 10 years, it would save about a trillion dollars in federal spending, I mean, in national spending. And the reason that it would do that is it would create a constructive public-private dynamic. Over time, my assumption is, and this, and this is borne out by the estimates, more and more Americans would get their coverage through this new national pool as employers ceased to provide coverage and decided that paying into this pool was a better way of insuring their workers. And that allows us to reap these administrative savings of having people in the pool and the savings that come from having the ability to negotiate for better rates and drug prices. So here's some policy details. But let me finish with the big picture. Because really, the purpose of these complex proposals is quite simple in the end. It is the goal of restoring the American dream of security and opportunity. If you work hard, if you do right by your families, you shouldn't be insecure in the United States. We think too often of security as opposed to opportunity. But security is the cornerstone of opportunity. We give corporations limited liability, after all, to encourage them to take risks. But while today we still have limited liability for American corporations, Increasingly, we have full liability for American families. The notion of what I'm reaching for was perhaps put best by, by a woman who wrote me after I wrote an op-ed on the decline of job-based benefits. She said, I read an article by you in the newspaper today. The article was about the economic risks mounting on middle-class families. I've never emailed an author before, but I looked you up on Google and found your email. I want you to know that your article tells the absolute truth, in my opinion. I think the decisions made by corporations and government that you described in the article also show that they do not re represent our interests. Then she said, I'm sick of working for the economy. I want an economy that works for me. It's a simple notion. An economy that works for us, that works for the Dorsets, that works for David Lamberger and his family, that works for Mark Carrera, for Craig Heyer, for the woman who wrote me, Andrea Case, for all of us. You know, it's hard to remember today when our society seems so deeply riven by political and social divisions, but we have so much in common when it comes to our economic hopes and values. Indeed, I think we have a lot more in common than we used to, because the great risk shift has reached into the lives of all Americans, from all classes and all races and all walks of life. What this crisis reminds us of is that in a very real sense, we are in this together. The great risk shift isn't someone else's problem. It's our problem, and it is our problem to fix. Thank you. Thank you. The first question of our speaker, as always, is from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is John Horvick. John Horvick is Project Director of Parents and Children, the Parents and Children Together Study at Oregon Health and Sciences University. John first joined City Club in 2004. He sits on the Research Board and the New Leaders Council, and he joined the Board of Governors in 2006. John? City Club has started a strategic planning process. And part of that process is trying to understand the social and political environment which will operate in the next five to ten years. What comments and advice do you have for a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on local, regional, and state public issues regarding two questions? How will citizens get their information about public issues? And two, what will motivate citizens to get involved in public issues? Thanks very much, John, and it's encouraging to see someone so young involved with the organization. In fact, one of the things that I wanted to mention was that I think that, as I mentioned, there's been a decline in, <clears throat> in civic America in the reach and penetration of volunteer organizations. But that decline is most dramatic, m most marked among people of my generation and younger. Um, and so that's probably the place to begin in thinking about how do we restore a healthy civic process in the United States. I'll say a few more words about that, but let me start by saying how vital I think this question is. Um, our politics has become much more dominated by media 
uh, and by, um, by campaign, campaigns than it once was. And as a result, it's also become much more dominated by money than it once was. And the vacuum that's been left by the decline of middle class organization that I talked about has been filled by extreme voices and infested interests. We need a place to talk about politics that is distinct from the market and from our private individual spheres, a, a public sphere, as Jürgen Habermas famously talked about. And this is the kind of organization that can serve that role. But if it's going to do so, I think we need to think seriously about how we attract people into the voluntary organizational world in a new environment. Younger Americans simply don't have as much interest in attending Elks meetings as did their parents, and their parents actually probably don't attend them either. Their parents' parents might have. Um, but we forget that at its peak, these voluntary organizations once played a vital role as cross-class organizations, bringing people into political deliberation. One idea that I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot of exposure to is the idea of, of deliberative polling, it's sometimes called. Um, my colleagues at Yale, uh, my colleague at Yale, Bruce Ackerman, pioneered this idea. And this is a process in which people come in and actually grapple with issues together. In a, in a structured process. So it's much different than me getting up here and telling you about the issues of the day. It's a chance for you to figure out what the trade-offs are yourself by look, in a guided process in which you have information uh, about what those trade-offs are. I would think that our debate in 2001 about the tax cuts would have been very different had people been forced to grapple with the question of what do we want to, really want to do with those uh, large projected surpluses that suddenly disappeared. Um, and in the same way, I think we should be grappling today with the question surrounding health care. What is the balance, for example, uh, between national and state action? How much are we willing to spend uh, ourselves and as a nation to cover everyone and so on? But I think that what I mentioned about the young is the most important point I want to end with. How do we bring young people into politics and into organizational life? Obviously, this campaign has witnessed a major resurgence in civic activity on the part of America's youth. And every time I teach a class, I point out to the younger Americans in the audience that, that their getting involved in politics is, is more vital in some ways than the involvement of their older uh, citizen peers because of the fact that so many of the decisions we make today are going to reverberate in their lives and in their children's lives. Um, and I have one idea, and that is that we need a civic life that's, that's more relevant. When I talk to my students again and again, they say, I want to volunteer at a soup kitchen. I want to work for a nonprofit. They want the sort of direct, tangible, hands-on involvement that comes uh, with, with being right there in the center of, of individualized activity. And organizations just seem so 1970s. Um, and what they need to feel is that they can join up with these larger organizations and organizational efforts, but in a way that provides them with that kind of feedback that they, that they get on an individual basis. I think that the Obama campaign has been successful in part because it's provided that. But obviously it needs to go beyond partisan political aims uh, to the question of rebuilding civic capacity more broadly. And I hope that the sort of brightest minds in organizational technology would put their put themselves apply themselves to this question of how we can reinvent our politics uh, around our new t and, and powerful technologies of communication. Great. Thank you. Okay, now we'll take questions from the, uh, the floor. Uh, just remember that asking questions at Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership, so please identify yourself as a member. Keep your question to 30 seconds or less. Remember it ends in a question mark, and if it doesn't, well, you'll get one of these and they won't like it. So go ahead, please. Uh, Fred Mathis, and yes, I'm a member. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that you are an advisor uh, to some of the candidates on health care issues and health care policy. When I moved to Portland, I could get a dermatologist, a cardiologist, a gastroenterologist, but I couldn't get a family doctor. The same thing went on in Massachusetts when they offered full coverage, people could not get a doctor. There's a shortage of nurses and family physicians and general internists in Oregon and across the country. Barbara Starfield, a name that you might know, recently asked me, access to what? 
And you're asking me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. No, it's a great question, and you're right about what's happened in Massachusetts. And I think that there's no question that our primary care infrastructure today is crumbling in the United States. And it might seem as if this is precisely why we, sh we, we should be cautious about expanding coverage, but I think the opposite is true. So first I want to say why we should expand coverage to more people even though we know that our primary care infrastructure is, is in very serious um, straits. And second of all, I want to say about how, how can we rebuild that infrastructure. So the fact is, is that much of the problem of the uninsured is getting borne by community medical institutions and primary care physicians today. They are the ones who are on the front lines, if you will, um, dealing with the crises that are created in the, uh, again and again by the fact that we don't have broader coverage. And so my proposal, the estimates are that it would immediately increase the amount of money going into uh, care provision by about 35 or 40 billion dollars. How can it not spend more money? Well, it saves that much in administrative savings and other sources. So it is a mistake to think that we should step back from expanding coverage because we know that primary, the primary care world is under strain. But that said, I think there are, there are two areas where we need to fundamentally change um, our delivery system for care in ways that encourage primary care um, much more than we have today. Um, one is that we need to pay primary care providers more. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's actually borne out by the cross-national evidence. You might hear that we pay doctors in the U.S. more than other countries, but the gap is pretty small when it comes to primary care. It's really specialty care where most of the money goes. Primary care doctors in the United States make a very modest living compared with other uh, professionals. And our payments under Medicare and other public programs are woefully inadequate um, for these doctors. So I would say, just as a first priority, restructure the payments so that you're paying primary care doctors a lot more than you are now for the services they're delivering. That, over the long term, is going to bring more people into primary care. The second thing I would argue that we need to do, and this may be stra sound strange coming from someone with a a more progressive bent is I think we need to change our malpractice system fundamentally. Uh, because it's really primary care where I see the malpractice system breaking down again and again. My mom's a nurse uh, in OBGYN and she's here today. Um, and from my talking with, with, with physicians in, 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 in that area, the malpractice premiums are astronomical. Um, and that's precisely the kind of areas that we want people to go into. Someone dismiss, uh, s dismissively said to me that, um, that you know, all these other countries that you talk about having lower costs than we do, all they do well is deliver babies and provide preventive care. I'm like, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> Let's deliver babies and, and provide preventive care. And, um, and the fact is, is that we don't have the incentives to get more and more doctors into the area where they're delivering babies and doing preventive care. I would say one last thing, which is that as part of reform, I would argue that we need to actually make a f upfront commitment to what's sometimes called a medical home. That is the idea that people would have a primary care physician who is their doctor who they could go to um, under, any, under any reform plan. And that the only way for that to work is that we basically say that people who take on that role of coordinating uh, their patient's care would receive additional payment for that. So it strikes me that there is a short-term and a long-term agenda here and that over the long term, putting more money into primary care and, 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 limit, and getting rid of the problem of the uninsured is going to bring more people into primary care over the long term. In the short term, it's a little harder, but I think that we're going to have to recognize that we have to put up a lot more resources to make primary care work. Thank you. Don't forget the nurses. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I, I would never do that. And my, mom, my mom's coming after me, so. <laughs> Paul Millian's club member. Um, you uh, cited statistics showing the huge and increasing gap between that middle 20% and the very top echelon of income earners in this country. How is that middle 20% doing against the 40 or 38% that uh, above them, between them and that top gap? How, how, how has that ratio changed? That's a good question. You know, for much of the 1980s, when in a, the late 1970s and 1980s, when inequality was growing, it looked a bit like an accordion. That is, it was a stretching out across the distribution. And so you had a lot of talking about how, well, it must be a college degree that's really accounting for the gap between those who are doing well and those who are not. 
Um, but the 1990s brought a fundamentally different pattern in which, which is sometimes called polarization. Basically, the very top is pulled farther and farther away from the rest of Americans. Paul Krugman, who's written a lot about this uh, from his own distinctive perspective, he's now a Nobel laureate, so I guess when I quote him, it, it may sound slightly more authoritative. Um, Paul Krugman has made a joke that, um, that we'll have real efforts to address inequality when the vice presidents march on Washington because they suddenly realize they're making so much less than their, the CEOs in the same firm. And there is a surprising element of truth to this view. If you look at the distribution of income, the top 1% has seen its share of income, including capital gains and other sources, rise uh, from about 8 9% to 23% since the 1970s, its share of total income. Um, but if you break it down, it's really at the very top. So the top one-tenth of one percent has seen its income rise about four or five-fold. The top one-tenth of one-hundredth of one percent has seen its income increase seven-fold. So as you break it down, you realize more and more that we have what I call in this forthcoming book a, a winner-take-all economy. Um, and it's really not a story about the sort of upper middle class pulling away from the middle class or the working class. It's a story about the very, very well-off pulling away from the rest of us. And I think that's actually a nice connection to the book, to the great risk shift. Because if we were in a situation in which what we were talking about is people who are doing a lot better economically, having to face more risk, the response would be very different than the situation we have today, where really middle class Americans all the way up to uh, a pretty high income are facing the kinds of strains that were once felt only by the working poor in the United States. And that's an explosive situation for a society to be in. We need to stop there. Our time is up. Uh, I want to remind you next week we're going to have the post-election panel. I invite you to come for that. And as we break uh, and adjourn, I want us all to thank Jacob Hacker, one of our own. I think we're all very proud of him. Thank you. <laughs>